Okay, I've got the. Okay. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my work is, uh, I had to figure out how to talk about it, but I looked back over years and years of my work and I found uh, three or four or five threads that run through everything. And it happens to be connected to my early childhood, which, you know, those early influences have stayed with me and are sort of the brown rice and vegetables of my work. Next. I, I am a kinesthetic learner. I, I, I have to touch it and feel it and smell it and roll in it and climb it and lick it. And I have to feel it with my whole body along with these emotional feelings that I have. I'm the middle daughter of three. I was the dancer, the bike rider, the tree climber, the uh, uh, acrobatic person, the roller skater. My sister was the athlete, but I was more creative person. And being the middle daughter, I was, uh, well, I was emotional and uh, uh, I needed a lot of extra attention. And um, so it was difficult for my mother. Next. So I started my uh, art education very early and Disney helped me out with uh, their wonderful coloring books. But I studied line, believe it or not, at a young age. Uh, and line can be graceful and beautiful and angular. It can be thick, it can be thin. And to be able to draw on somebody else's drawing as a child, I felt very special. It was very good for my nervous system to uh, spend time with these pages of rough newsprint. Next. Sorry. So line is a, a very, very big part of every piece of work I do. It runs through everything. Uh, this is a black and white painting that I did. I, for a while there, I was putting a black and white uh, painting in each show that I did. Uh, it's sort of a challenge for myself, but um, you can see the, the thick and the thin and the graceful line that I used, uh, used to see in the coloring books. Next. And this is a more recent painting. Uh, you know, it just, uh, for me, it feels intuitive. It just, uh, the piece calls for something uh, that is out of control. So this big black line is uh, probably painted with a paintbrush that's taped to a stick so that I lose control um, and then I can address that. But um, then I have the vertical lines or horizontal lines at the top there on the left, um, usually a black and white section somewhere. It seems to be repeating through the work. Next. This was uh, also an influence for me and one of the threads that runs through every piece I do. This was where my mom's happy place was and therefore we were happy. Um, and evidently the uh, horizon line is supposed to be very soothing for the nervous system. Next. So this is a painting I, it, from years ago, but uh, I was challenged by my adult daughter that was in um, art school. And she said, mom, you have issues with sky. And I thought about that. I, I okay, I'll take on that challenge. Well, it's not sky, it's that line. It's that horizon line that is present in everything, even if I look at interior paintings that I've done, you know, somebody indoors, there is a, 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 a horizontal line that is present. So it isn't about sky, it's about that stability of that line, that horizon line. Next. I usually paint family members because I, I do all that I can to stay connected to the work. So because my heart is involved, with a family member, I can paint the emotion better. Um, and so referring to the horizon line, this line is traveling now throughout the whole composition, all the way down through her suit into the reflection in the sand. Next. Uh, this is a Salinas uh, strawberry field. Uh, my dad was a produce broker and so getting in the car and taking a two hour drive all through Salinas Valley, row after row, field after field. This was something that was imprinted on me. 
And as a kid, you want to know what's going to happen next. You want to be able to predict the future. And so seeing these fields and feeling that I know what's next, I've seen it, I've seen it, uh, it shows up in my work. I, I didn't know what the patterning was about, but I think it comes back to this. Next. So there's uh, these horizontal lines all the way through here. And for me, it adds stability so that you can then focus on something that's a little bit more difficult. The emotions of a person sitting there, you, you don't have a conversation with them, but you have some empathy for them, or you feel you, feel you might well up, you might, your own emotions get stirred. But with the stability of that line work, I can handle something like that. Next. These, these are family members uh, and I, I ran this stencil all the way up their bodies and over their faces. It's a stencil I made. I make a lot of my stencils. Um, I'm not interested in faces. I, we all know where the, the eyes are, where the nose goes. We know that. I want you to look at the body language and what is trying to be expressed or secretly expressed. Um, and uh, I want you to be curious about what's behind those stencils, like what is what is being hidden. So a little a little mystery is always uh, interesting to me. Next, I studied abstract uh, compositions through my uh, breakfast. Um, I was served, a, you know, a, a bowl of Cheerios, which is um, chaotic and out of order. And as I uh, ate down into the milk, um, there, there was a negative space involved. Every time I took a bite, there would be fewer and fewer Cheerios. They'd swirl around and a new composition would emerge. And I, I did this really regularly. And I think it has a lot to do with, you know, being interested in putting abstract work in the work. This is an underpainting, uh, I call it the Cheerio effect because it's a full bowl. And, uh, but what I do is take, I, instead of wasting paint and letting it dry on the palette, I'll put it on a blank canvas, random. But I have already mixed these colors for this past painting I'm, I've done. So I've added pattern and line and you know color combinations that I wanna test out and uh, what looks good next to another. Um, and it, it's like filling a toolbox full of uh, things I can use for the future. Next. So this will be covered over with what my main work is, which is to paint emotion and using the female figure as the vehicle. But parts of it can be saved out and will be. And it's, a, it's my choice. It's I cover it all. I can leave part. I can save this, save that. I can do the editing, but I'm starting with lots of choices. Next. So this is a painting of my daughter. Uh, she was having a, an emotional moment and the abstract piece next to her was saved out. Um, and it sort of mirrors her, um, uh, you know, she was mixed up and couldn't decide and, you know, it was just uh, a difficult time and it feels like it goes with her um, as uh, like a partnership. Next. My mother was my first muse. She was uh, bigger than life um, and uh, up and down, laughing, crying, yelling, screaming. And so I kept my eye on her and I studied her uh, regu regularly. Um, I didn't really believe what she said, but I believed what her body said. In fact, at this age, I, my mother, re, she's told me this story where I asked her, uh, why is your nose mad? Because, you know, her face would be saying one thing and her body would be saying another. So she was my muse. She was somebody I watched. And therefore, I have painted a lot of father I mean, mother-child uh, combinations um, and, uh, you know, sort of talking about that relationship that I had with her. Uh, and that abstract piece behind her comes right through, through the dress and um, she, the mother is carrying a lot of emotion and the child is um, safe. Uh, and the mother has some kind of tension and on the lookout, maybe feeling um, like she's shielding the child which is something I um, desired. 
next. Another mother daughter or you know, adult child. When two friends get together, they sort of, uh, if there's a child involved, uh, sometimes the child is um, ignored. And so that's why she's kind of painted out there. My mother was very, very social. So this kind of was how it was. You know, the friends were really important to her. Next. I studied figure drawing from the uh, fashion ads in the Chronicle newspaper for years and years. I had a big fat tracing tablet and I would trace those figures every day. And I learned how the body works and how, what the shoulders do in, in relation to the hips. Um, and this is my family. Next. I put this painting in because it, it collects all the threads and illustrates uh, how I use what I learned as a kid. Uh, there's that horizon line and uh, there's a lot of abstract work done here. It could be, you know, beach stuff, paraphernalia, but it's not spelled out. I, I'd rather it not be. Uh, there's a lot of patterning. Uh, there's um, a female figure that carries the emotion um, and she is involved in either watching something or feeling something. And it's also done in a monochromatic um, palette, which is very soothing. So along with the chaos of the abstractness, there is a soothing quality also. Next. My influences were the Bay Area figurative painters. I had, uh, I was married, I had two children and I went back to UC Santa Cruz to finish my degree. And I I was introduced to these people and I was shocked because I, they painted like I paint and uh, they, they didn't have to be tight and photorealism and, and cleaned up and make a lot of sense. I was so validated by this and uh, I went on to really it really changed the way I worked and it really helped my career to see, see people like this. Next. So the, the, the David Park painting with the woman with a towel reminded me of hanging laundry up and I've done a lot of laundry paintings um, with my mother there uh, trying to escape really, have her own thoughts and be left alone. And I would go out and try to join her and thought we'd have you know, special time. <laughs> and uh, it, it was difficult because she would be lost in her thoughts. And, um, you know, she, her marriage was rocky and she's little, very little money. And, but um, then I have the horizontal, vertical rather, <laughs> stripes going through, which uh, I have a stencil and I use that for that, but um, it just sort of stabilizes everything for me. Next, uh, Edward Hopper, a big influence uh, with, with the dramatic lighting and, and the mystery and uh, you know, solo figure kind of assess, kind of a moodiness. Uh, I, I really have always loved that. There's a little bit of danger maybe. Next, it's my, one of my paintings I chose to depict my influence here with the overhead lighting and um, I don't feel any danger, but it certainly is uh, like that dark background, uh, you know, not really uh, illustrated in any way. And then there's that abstract piece down at the bottom there, the, that rectangle, which is always included. Next. Uh, Dorothea Lang, a uh, photographer from the 30s, and she, you know, she photographed the plight of the Dust Bowl, especially zeroing in on women and, and what they were going through and, you know, their body language and, you know, uh, their angst. Uh, she did such a beautiful job with them. And so I've, I've come to realize that uh, women use their arms a lot. I, I who knew, but... Um, Next, um, you know, they, they sort of shelter themselves. They fix their hair. It's a way to sort of turn inward a, a moment to themselves. And uh, this has got the line drawing in it and the stencil, big repeating circles, dramatic lighting that comes from Edward Hopper. Next. And uh, so here are the arms again. Um, and, you know, I paint the same woman. It's, it's me, it's you, it's universal. Um, and I don't 
change the dress. The hair is the same, the shoes are the same, um, but I, the, it's the uh, emotion that I want you to pay attention to. Next, David, uh, Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, I, I loved him for his um, looseness and uh, lack of fussiness. And uh, not everything makes sense, like the figure in the background, uh, you know, are those two legs? That person is pretty tall. And the aqua X in the foreground just left. Her arm is extra long and it doesn't seem to matter. So lots of excuses, you know, uh, things that are just left as, as is. And I, I really got influenced by that. Next. So this is my mother at uh, in Mexico looking at a shuffleboard game, but she's drifted off and I, that's what I love. I love to see the persona dropped. I want to see the honesty of what's really going on. I don't have to know the story. I just feel the person being more honest and real with themselves. And that's, that's, what, that's the most delicious part. Next. Nature. Uh, is always a place where you let your guard down. You've got that sun baking on the back of your legs and you hear that water. You're watching a mother nurture a child. Um, I mean, all these things add to the emotion of the painting. Uh, and then I have that red chair and there's a red folding chair that is amused for my studio. Uh, I've had it for years and I thought I get to do whatever I want. I'm going to put the chair in. Next. Uh, so now I'm um, finishing up and I'm going to show you a progression of a painting. And for the sake of time, I've skipped a lot of um, phases. So this is the beginning uh, where it's an underpainting with a line drawing of mine, uh, crudely done. The figure is really clunky, big head, uh, you know, not very well drawn. Um, and so the next one. You know, she's more settled in her pose. She's starting to feel some emotion, the turn of her head, uh, the, the dropping of the shoulder and things are more um, realistic on the table. There's a cheese grater now, but there's that horizon line. Um, the line work is still there. There's patterning, repeated. And this is the final one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, those little windows behind her, do they stay? I don't know. Let's see. Go ahead, Hedwig. I'm oh. sorry, I was too fast. <laughs> they're edited out, but they lived there for a while. Um, but there's a horizon line. There's abstract work on the tabletop. Um, you know, I my chair was near the painting, and I really liked how it looked, so I put the chair in. Uh, you know, that that cabinet or counter next to her, that white one, you know, it doesn't have to make sense. It's just, you know, part of the room. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's the finished product. And um, that's the end of my talk. And I appreciate you including me for this opportunity. Oh, one more, me in my studio on the red chair. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Linda. Oh my gosh. It's such a treat to see the richness oh. and uh, to realize that each painting has a, has a life, you know, that there's, you're, you're uh, progressing through it. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that it's also that progression is also part of the grounding for you. Yeah, part of the hell and back too, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> I mean, it's just feeling around in the dark. You know, I have no idea where this is going, you know? And I was <laughs> thinking about the underpainting, like as a starting place, that that's, and you talked about the horizon and the, and the horizontals, that the grounding or the underpainting has a similar kind of grounding that oh, you're yeah. building from the ground up and then you're so building. I'm, I'm bringing myself to it because I've already done all that mixing. So uh -huh. I always try to include myself as much as possible. Yeah, and that you're and you're very brave about in that too. It's not like overly emotional, drippy kind of get you in the, in the feeling. It's it's subtle and quiet and there's a presence there that's very calming, you know, with all the other that's all the rest that's going going on and but placed. You know, it, mm. it's, it's gorgeous. Really gorgeous.
Thank you. Yeah, I'm amazed at how much I learned about uh, Linda's art with just even that small presentation. I was like, wow, you know, I mean, I've been following her work for a, a really long time, but that was, that was very educational. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I want to say the same thing. I've been following her for a long time and now I get to see her work up close and personal. And it's pretty amazing. So this talk today just like ticked and tied a whole lot of wonderful things about you and the paintings and why I'm, a, why I'm moved by them. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. I just have to say uh, that was awesome. I can't even think of enough fabulous words, Linda. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. I love uh, the Dorothea Lang influence. I studied her in college. One of the first classes I took um, at a junior college was a history class and we had to pick someone to focus on. And I just picked her, had no idea who she was because I was just drawn to her work. So I love that that influenced your paintings and as well as the agriculture. My husband works in agriculture too. And I remember being a kid driving down a row and being fascinated with the the shutter of the the orchards. And I love that you included that part too. I just it felt I felt so connected to your presentation. I just I love your work, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I do too, Linda. I think um I love how you bring your past into um everything you do and how your whole life has been influenced and and it shows in your paintings it's really cool thank, thank you. you thanks bonnie i wish i had listened to your talk before i had mine <laughs> you gave me so many cues and i don't know if i'm going to be able to fit them in but uh, i agree with the person <laughs> who just said uh the because i grew up in watsonville and uh and i had many of those same experiences with the, all the linear stuff as a kid you know i really i really got that that was really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else have a question or a comment for Linda before we, before we go on? I have sort of a technical question. <clears throat> Linda, I love your work. I recently discovered it. Not, not like everyone who has spoken so far that said they've followed you, but for a long time, I have just recently discovered your work and I love the immediacy and the intimacy in it and that you're painting women and that there are women that are reflecting you that really resonated with me. I want to try to paint like that too, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, um, do you paint um, plein air when you do this? Or do you sketch something and then finish in the studio? I'm just curious about that technical question. Um, I use photographs, family photographs. Uh, we had a family friend that was a fantastic black and white photographer. And he always took family poolside, beachside, you know, so it's like great. Um, you know, material for me. Um, and a lot of times I make it up because I, as I, as I'm working, I feel it. And I, I know those poses, I know those stances, I know those feelings. And so a lot of times it's just, uh, I, I just um, make it up. <laughs> I really work. I mean, I, I, I had daughters, I come from daughters, my mother came from daughters. It's just like, it's everywhere. And then what you're saying about the art, with the arms. That's that resonates with me a lot too, because we carry, we protect, mm -hmm. we comfort, we do, we us women, we do so much with our arts, with our arms. So that yeah. really resonated with me too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, I also appreciate on your Instagram page how you show the process of your work, like where it starts, and then we get to see what the end result is. And I'm always um, I always think I'm not going to be surprised by the end result. Like, I think I can predict it, but I can't. And I just feel like um, that's such an exciting thing for us to be able to like follow and watch as you're like fine tuning things. And maybe your original plan, it, you know, doesn't even end up on the palette, oh. but um, just the emotion that I feel like evokes from your work. 
I commented on something not too long ago that you just posted and it just, it was just a day with my daughters that it, you know, it's not always easy. It's rough. They're adults and graduating high school and there's a lot of things that they go through. And I feel like your paintings, I find comfort in them because I feel like there's a mom that like is, knows what I'm going through when I see those paintings. I put those uh, progression of a painting up and I'll, I'll tell you, it's brutal sometimes. Go back, go back. I liked it better before. You know, you oh. know, I did that a lot. Stop, don't put any more paint on. Oh, I got to paint the painting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. You know, it, it's not always easy. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for that. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Linda. That was really oh, welcome. Very inspiring and rich and you know, deeply felt. It was very beautiful. Yay! That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, now our next wonderful artist is a different kind of treat. Doug Weiser is an artist of many talents and media, including sound collage, music, collaborations with dance and theater groups, and he's most noted for his immense body of work in cardboard, even being referred to as Mr. Cardboard in our community. <laughs> uh, to quote Wallace Bain in one of Cruz's most daring and mischievous, mischievous artists, a playful yet committed provocateur, provocateur whose work, work often shines with pointed political messages and irreverent humor. His work is, and then unquote, his work is full of rich, colorful, delightful, and thought-provoking storytelling. Please welcome Dag. Hey, Wallace is a really nice guy. <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. That's probably why he said all those really nice things. So. <laughs> but okay. thank you. Thank you so much for having me and including me with Linda and Juan, who's, I'm just pretty blown away. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I did that painting of Linda and uh, her painting. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I'm starting with this, um, uh, I'm starting with this picture of um, my, some of my cardboard art, uh, because if you, if you look across the floor there, there's uh, two or three um, cardboard ants and and I contributed uh, several um, cardboard ants to the um, current takeaway PVA thing. So that's the main reason that this picture is here. But it's also kind of a little compendium of, of a lot of my cardboard art. And uh, I was really happy that I listened to Linda so I could just say a little bit about my my history with cardboard art in a few sentences is that I I was a painter for a long time and and I was like kind of schlepping my art around from one rental to another and getting really tired of that and somewhere along the line I I started uh, uh, making art out of cardboard uh, so I didn't have to be so precious about it I could show it for a little while and then I could recycle it. And a lot of what you're seeing in this picture has been recycled. <laughs> there's some crows, there's some ants, there's some uh, skeletons with chicken bodies, there's a lot of flowers. Anyway, a lot of that stuff has gone to the recycling center and I couldn't be more happy. So uh, let's move on to the next picture. Uh, this is uh, uh, for, <clears throat> for uh, many, many years, closing in on 40 years, I've done a, um, a one night only art uh, uh, exhibition uh, ma made entirely of cardboard art in, um, in front of my house here in Santa Cruz. <clears throat> and this is just one, uh, one, of, one of the 40, one of the 40 examples. It was a um, orchestra of uh, black and white um, violin players. And uh, there's a couple more pictures of these guys, so you can move from next to the next one. Oh yeah, there's the orchestra, and I had them all. Uh, I had them all kind of wired together, so uh, their arms would move, and there was a weird soundtrack, and um, it was it was just really great outdoor 
art installation, which I continue to this day. Oh, there's another one. There's just one of the violin players <laughs> with flames jutting out of his head. <laughs> okay, the next picture. There we go. Okay, this is a this is a a, a more current um, outdoor cardboard art installation. Uh, I call this one the last waltz of the penguins, uh, or um, slash penguins on fire. Uh, you can see some of the penguins that have flames jutting out of their heads. Unfortunately, it's very very sad. They're kind of an ecological uh, cardboard art theme. I think there's another one coming up after this. There we go. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more of the car. There's a lot more of the penguins on fire there. <laughs> uh, but once again, with a soundtrack and uh, the last couple of outdoor um, cardboard themes I've done uh, definitely have, yeah, like this, have a, well, this isn't, this isn't necessarily an ecological bent. This is more of a, a, a wartime uh, bent. This is my chicken hawk theme, the, uh, the, uh, the raw chickens with the skull heads dancing around the uh, chicken hawk chicken bucket. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the the theme of the chicken hawk chicken is uh, uh, I can't re <laughs> I, I can't remember what I wrote uh, something about uh, worth the batter they're on or uh, <laughs> we're, we're going into better for what does it say we're going into better for. oh yeah worth going into batter for thank you Hedwig <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, another uh, outdoor uh, cardboard art uh, uh, thing that I did. I will, I, uh, I do an outdoor art, uh, cardboard art thing every year. And I spend a couple of months putting it together out of all, out of uh, cardboard. And it's a one night only um, art thing. And, uh, and people are welcome to come and check it out. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. Oh, this was, uh, this was a couple of years ago. This is the same thing out in front of my house. I did this um, uh, in the middle of the Trump years when I thought, when I thought people needed a, a little bit quieter moment to, um, to reflect. And uh, I'd made uh, hundreds of uh, monarchs with uh, uh, black light paint, with fluorescent paint. And then we lit the whole thing with black lights. And it was very mellow and very, very, uh, and very calm. And that, that was a great night. It seemed like everybody that came that night was just, just having a really happy, fine, fun, quiet moment. <laughs> uh, this is another cardboard art thing I did in front of my house. It was the, uh, it was the, I can't remember exactly what I called it. It was the, uh, it was the Last Supper with a, a, with a Halloween theme. There was a, all the apostles had all their carving tools and there was a lot of, a lot of you can tell from the table there, there's a lot of pumpkin guts all over the place and they're drinking an awful lot of wine. And uh, I think the next picture shows the other side of the apostles. There they are, there's the other apostles. And you can see that they're kind of, uh, looking up there a little bit, or at least the apostles closest to the, uh, the Christ figure are looking up and, and shaking their, uh, their uh, there's carving tools. And there's the next picture. And there he is. And there's, a, and there's the Christ pumpkin um, taking off into the stratosphere. Uh, the uh, the uh, wings were articulated. I haven't motorized, so they're flapping. So, um, that was a lot of fun. That was one of my better card, one night only cardboard art uh, uh, happenings. Uh, this is one of my latest cardboard things. I, I, went, I went through a period where I was, I was making um, interesting looking cardboard flowers. Um, I think some of the next pictures have some, some of the earlier cardboard flower things, but I went through a, lo a long period. Well, that's not it, but it, um, there will be some in, in, coming up that show uh, 
the beginnings of the cardboard flower thing. So this is this is a small piece I did for a person up in um, up in um, up north that that wanted a. It's pretty big. It's like four by four. They wanted a little. Uh, they wanted a little cardboard uh, flower thing for their wall, so I made that for them. <clears throat> This was part of a, uh, uh, over in the, over, over across the hill, there was this thing called the art party and they were having a um, Alice in Wonderland theme. Uh, and they were asking artists to do any kind of uh, art that had some kind of Alice in Wonderland thing. So I made this cardboard uh, uh, pill, pill cake for, uh, for the Alice in Wonderland thing. I was very, very happy with that, with that piece of art. Oh, here we go. So this is one of the, uh, this is one of the, I, I had done a, uh, a, a, a Market Street um, art thing <clears throat> with flowers and bees. And then the Ma, the Ma Museum of Art and History approached me to make a, uh, a uh, three-story, Oh, hanging that came down the whole um, uh, atrium of the three stories. <clears throat> and so I spent um, quite a long time making this thing. It's like 28 feet long with flowers and bees. And uh, this has got a really crazy story attached to it where um, uh, they they'd, uh, asked me to make it. I made it. Uh, it was right on the cusp of the, the COVID crisis. I hung this in the stairway and, uh, and two days later, the, uh, the Ma closed permanently for um, COVID. And, and so this hung in the museum for a year <laughs> without anybody seeing it. And, uh, and when the Ma reopened, uh, uh, they asked me to take it down. So uh, very few people saw that piece of art, <laughs> which I kind of like in some kind of really weird, bizarre way. I kind of like that. I'm just, I'm weird that way. But uh, it was a lot of work for a lot of, not a, not a lot of people seeing it. <laughs> oh, this is a, this is a top, top end view of another, uh, piece of cardboard art I did for the uh, museum. It was, it was part of their um, surf show. And, and they asked me to make another um, three-story wall hanging. It's like 28, 30 feet long. And it's, uh, it was all done. I, I uh, used metallic paper on cardboard. And, and then I, I, I put it on a motor so it would spin around. And then, uh, and then we lit it from all kinds of angles, and the uh, and the result was kind of a, like a giant mirror ball. So it it was a, it was really great for the surf show because um, uh, it was like a giant mirror ball, and and there was like all this reflection all over the inside of the uh, museum. It was it was really nice and really perfect. And you can see you can see on some of the some of the little uh, triangles. There's words finger bowl, river mouth. And what the museum had done is they'd gone around all these surfers and asked them for all their, their hot spot surfer spots. And it's notoriously difficult to get any surfer to tell you where, where a good spot to surf is. But uh, they managed to get, you know, 40 or 50 uh, spots from the surfers. And so every once in a while, you'll see us, you'll see a, a little spot where they, they, they give it a name, you know, like river mouth right there. That was one of my favorite pieces of art. <clears throat> so uh, I do other art besides a cardboard. Um, many, many years ago, I think it says <clears throat> 92 there. Uh, my parents asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I said, uh, well, I would really like a, uh, I would really like a set of uh, pastels. Why don't you give me a set of chalks? I'd really, I really enjoy that. Thank you very much. And they did. And and that set me off on a year long um, chalks and uh, pastel uh, exploration. And this is one of them. And this is another. This is, uh, this is one of my nuclear family um, 
<clears throat> and this is kind of, I'll segue into this other aspect of my art where I have certain themes. I have certain themes that I'll go back and forth to many, many, many times. Um, nuclear family being one of them, man, woman, child. I mean, in the 50s sense of, of nuclear family. And then going up into the 60s and the 70s, where it was like man, woman, 2.4 child or whatever they were coming up with back in those days. And uh, I had a lot of fun making 2.4 children. Uh, but uh, I've gone back and forth. I'm not going to show a lot of my nuclear family art, but this is one of them. This is one of the, one of the pastels that I did a long time ago. Uh, I've done I've done a lot of work with theatrical uh, companies, the Crash, Burn, and Die, and the Moving and Storage Dance Companies from the '80s and '90s. Some of my most productive years were working with uh, Leslie Swaha and Therese Adams of those companies. And this, I'd made this coat. I'm a, a good friend, Therese Adams, had spent a couple of years doing theater in Japan. And she had all of her uh, possessions thrown out of a three-story building to crash down on the streets below. And she told me that story, which was really horrible. And uh, and she said, "Can you make a um, can you make a can you make a piece of art? Can you make something for the theater that will commemorate that moment in my life?" And I and I said, Are you "Sure, I can do that." And, uh, and this is what I came up with, this, this coat with tons of broken stuff all over it. Uh, there's no picture of the back of it, but the back looks as, as busy of that, if, if not busier. And uh, it makes a great uh, sound. It makes a great sound when the dancers are clattering around. You can see all the silverware under the arms, very silvery sound, and the dishes make a really wonderful sound. So uh, she put that to great use in a couple of dances. This is probably my favorite piece of art that I've ever made. Uh, I, I can't even remember what political era we were in. It probably doesn't matter. It seems like they're all the same after a while. But um, I was really disturbed by the influence of American politics into the rest of the world. And, uh, and I decided, and then I had this idea to make a, uh, an American flag uh, crawling out at you, and uh, and I call it exporting democracy. And um, I'm not too sure what happened to this piece of art. It's 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 traveled around, and I've lost track of it. But it was one of the few pieces that I made with uh, with different materials. It was made with PVC, and then I would put wood on the on the on the top of it, and a lot of sanding and a lot of uh, bending of the PVC and then making the structure behind it, which was, was incredibly intricate in order to like screw all those pieces on. And um, I'm, I'm still very, very happy with that piece of art as a political, uh, as a political statement. <clears throat> and uh, so part of my art trajectory is if I have a, uh, an idea, um, and it doesn't work with cardboard, or it, uh, or if if I if I feel like there's a medium that would express that idea it, the best that it can be expressed, I'll 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 try to figure out how to to uh, to make that happen. And I uh, and uh, uh, many many years ago, I was going through a box of my old art drawings, and I found this really simple pencil drawing of this basically a play on words, which was cheeses on the cross. And I had a little, I had a little uh, pencil drawing of a cross and a couple of slices of cheese on it. And I threw the, uh, I threw the drawing into the box and I forgot about it. And then a year or two ago, I found the drawing and I said, I'm going to make that now. <clears throat> and, um, and so I took uh, four months of ceramics classes to learn how to learn just enough ceramics 
to uh, start making the cheese. And the uh, crosses are made with cardboard, many, many uh, multi-layers of cardboard. But uh, I, uh, I made cheese in the ceramic class for four months. And uh, it was very funny because I was this guy in the ceramic class and that's all I was doing was making cheese. And, and people were like, and they're all doing their like ceramics thing. And, and, uh, and I'm sure it was like, what's up with this guy with the, the making cheese? And I didn't tell anybody about the project until I was leaving the class. And I said, well, come to the art show and then you'll see, see what it's all about. So there's a couple of other pictures. Uh, so this is, the, this is the cheeses on the cross with the um, hand painted um, glaze. Really like that one. This is the one with the uh, no glaze. It's called stoneware. It's really beautiful. Uh, I learned an awful lot about ceramics in just four months. And uh, well, I learned a lot about cheese too. I mean, I learned a lot about the texture of cheese. I was, it was, oh, <laughs> so there's, go, go past the uh, crucifix thing, uh, Hedwig. There's like, there's one more, uh, there's one more uh, cheese on the cross, I think, after the crucifix. I think I had a picture of the go go one. Oh, there we go. And and this is the uh, and this is the third one. I did three crosses with three different types of glaze, and uh, I must have made uh, well, gosh, I must have made eighty pieces of cheese in four months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can go back to the crucifix. So uh, this is another example of, uh, of having an idea and, and trying to figure out what, what the best medium for that idea is. And I wanted to do a series of crucifix bottle openers of which this is one, I did several. And, uh, and I feel that a lot of questions about the religious significance of this piece, but I have to tell everybody that it has very little, very little to do with religion and much more to do with addiction and alcoholism. And, um, and most of the crucifix bottle openers have much more to do with that. But when I was trying to decide what medium best to, to um, do that in, I picked bronze. And the same thing with the, uh, the uh, ceramics. I, I took several months of bronze classes in order to make this series. And that was a lot of fun, but it's funny. The same with the ceramics or the bronze. Once I was through with the idea and with the series, I, uh, I, I didn't have any desire to go back to either medium. I just, I I'm always going, I'm always drawn to cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when I was caretaking my parents for for many many years, um, I uh, I didn't I didn't have access to a lot of my art stuff, so I I um, started painting. I could I could have a tray full of oil paints and. Um, and I could stretch a canvas and I could paint. This is one of the paintings I did while I was caretaking for my parents. This is another one. Uh, it, was, it was a great way to, to uh, I, I, I re, uh, like I was saying earlier, I, I, I'd, I'd fallen away from painting in lieu of cardboard, but this stuff, harkens back to a lot of the work I was doing in the um, late 70s and early 80s. Beautiful. And it was, it was really fun to, to get back into painting. And I think I have a couple of my more current ones. These are a couple of years old, but I think there's a couple more current ones coming up. And there are oil paintings. Yeah, this, this is a acrylic on um, canvas. And I just started getting into these paintings and uh, I don't know how I feel about that. They're, they're so, uh, I have this really weird Virgo tendency to get really detail oriented. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of antithetical of the cardboard thing, but I, I still really enjoy it. But uh, I've been doing these, this kind of paintings lately. There's another one, pretty, just shape. I, 
people ask, what do you call them? I just, I just call them shapes and colors. <laughs> That's all I, I don't know what else to call them. You know, I call them a pain in the ass is what I call them because by the time <laughs> I'm through with them, by the time I'm through with them, I just like, oh, okay, is this ever going to be over? <laughs> oh, this is one of the first ones I did of that nature. Mm, I, nice. This, this is still one of my favorite paintings. You yeah. can see in this, you can see in this painting, this, um, Back in the uh, back in the seventies uh, uh, and eighties, I was a cross. I was a pen and ink guy, and and there was a, and cross hatching was my 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 place to go, mm. and it was really fun to get back into cross hatch. You can see tons of cross hatching in this painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very happy with this painting. And this is the last one I did. I only did this a couple months ago. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, this this painting's got a little bit of a story. Uh, I was in between homes uh, when I painted this, and uh, I was living way up in the mountains, and um, and I had I had zero uh, art supplies, and and so I went to the art store. I bought a uh, bought a couple of stretcher bars. I bought a piece of canvas. I bought one tube of black paint, and um, a little tiny can of uh, paint thinner. And I occupied my time up in the mountains in this yurt uh, painting that. And, uh, and uh, it's still one of my favorite paintings. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it definitely harkened back to my uh, early days in the um, late seventies as a pen and ink guy. So wow. um, yeah, very, um, mm. I really love that painting. That, that painting means a lot to me. This is some of my most current uh, uh, cardboard art. Um, mm. um, can you go one, one thing further and we can come back to that, Hedwig? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is um, when I'm doing all that other cardboard art, the, uh, the uh, flowers and the bees and the, uh, and the uh, skulls and the chickens and all that stuff. I put down a, I put down a layer of cardboard uh, to work on. And that cardboard suffers hundreds and thousands of random cuts. And, and somewhere along the line, I was throwing out some of that cardboard and I just thought it had this really interesting texture to it. And so I started making these, um, pieces this is like a three by five it's a pretty big piece of art i started i started uh, collaging together these layers of that sliced up cardboard mm. and and then i would just do some really delicate uh spray painting on it to kind of bring out some of the the layers and the textures so that's all this detritus from doing all the other uh all the other crazy cardboard art. It's just this, this leftover stuff. So I consider it kind of like recycled, recycled art. And then if you go back to that color one, there we go. This was, you can still see the cuts and stuff in there. But um, uh, when I was doing all the random spray painting of the flowers and whatever I was spray painting, um, there would be these little layers, there would be these little things of, uh, leftover cardboard or I mean cardboard backing and so I saved all those pieces and I made that piece of art out of that and I put that I put that in a uh, oh, fabulous. oh here we go yeah that's okay that's okay I put that color one I, I hated it for a while I put it in a storage unit and then I got it back <laughs> out and then I really liked it <laughs> yeah so this is a this is a, this is another one of those kind of a sliced up uh, cardboard collage stuff and um, there's been two or three where the where the the, the background layer is a real uh, gold leaf and I, I like that juxtaposition between uh, mm -hmm. cardboard and gold <laughs> mm -hmm. so, there you go oh this is an this is yet another of those um, sliced up cardboard pieces I, I there, it's like one of my favorite things to do to um, to use the that kind of recycled recycled concept and turn it into kind of a semi a way way more permanent piece of art. It's just so funny how so much of my cardboard art gets recycled, but 
in some really kind of really bizarre way that sliced up stuff that I made that that recycles, I mean, that recycled art of is, is turned into more permanent pieces of art. I find that really interesting. And and um, and that's, that's one of my favorite pieces right there. Mm -hmm. Here's the final picture. I, I, I included this picture because the PVA uh, uh, showed my, my crows last year. And, and the crows had their moment in the sun and people really liked the cardboard crows. And I'm forever grateful for the Carl Valley Arts for selling so many of my crows. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> you did it, Doc. Oh, thank you. Yay. Wow. Absolutely. It was really a treat. What a treat. Thank you Very so much. So much. Up. What did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I said thank you. And, you know, <laughs> thank you so much for um uh, including me with linda you know i don't know linda personally but i followed her art for for a long long time and i'm really really happy that I've, i'm i'm getting to know juan fontes a, a little bit more because uh, me and him have a really strange kind of uh, tra tra uh um, trajectory in um the social the social justice you know mm -hmm. and uh and I have yet to really uh, bend his ear about that, but uh, I'm really uh -huh. happy to have met met Juan, and and he's great. He's a great artist too. Well, you you're so uh, there's so much to you, Dag. There's a lot of humor, and a lot of brilliant, wonderful art execution, and uh, and the meaning of you know with your social social justice. Very, saying like the, mm -hmm. like your flag and your uh thank you cheeses on the cross i think you're um, you're it's unusual and it's thought provoking and yeah. maybe you know you know might have questions or something but it's wonderful to to witness you as you tell these stories because there's so much mm -hmm. i mean you bring there's a lot of depth in your work and you bring it when you speak about it you bring more for us to know about that yeah well you got me started and then I almost couldn't stop. So there you go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. I wanted to say one thing about that. Your Thanks a lot. The execution of your work too. The sensibility of how you apply paint with the, even the cardboard pieces comes into the, the um, paintings you did with pastels and then oils. It's just very, there's a sensibility of light and dark and soft and and linear mm -hmm. very it's, it's consistent throughout your work yeah yeah really, it's beautiful. yeah that's a weird thing i'm i think a lot of people in, including linda i was listening to her talk about her process and it's really weird it's really weird i i don't have any kind of uh i don't have any um uh i, di I didn't go to school and i and i and i know very little about art history but uh one thing that i um connected with her was is, is that you she would start she would start with this basic thing of shapes and colors and patterns and I was kind of really gratified and, and amazed to see that so much of that would get covered up and uh, the same thing happens with me I'm just uh, I will start a lot, a lot of those oil paintings and a lot of that cardboard stuff will start in a certain place but uh, if you saw a picture of where it started and where it ended it would be and it's always it's always really weird to to finish. And it's like, am I done? You know, am I am I actually finished with this? Mostly, it's like I get really tired of it. And I'm like, I'm finished now. <laughs> so, there, it's a delight what you do. Right? Oh, well, thank you very much. And really I think do. actually you were saved by not going to art school. Well, I'd like to think so. <laughs> yeah. You're unique. You're 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 what you give us is very unique. So thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ruby. Really appreciate it. Dag, I just want to say, I think you're brilliant and hilarious and inspiring. Oh, Chris. And hey, I, Chris. Love, I love your irreverence. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I wish everybody <laughs> did. <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Okay. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I actually get very little, I actually get very little heat for my irreverence. I'm, I'm very gratified with, with how people respond to, uh, yeah. Because I'm not really trying to push anybody's buttons. I'm just trying to say something. So thank you. 
I think we all take ourselves too seriously. It's good to have more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Chris. Oh, hey, Beth. Hey, Dick. Um, yeah, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you for my Marlboro man who lives in my living room. Oh, yeah, there you <laughs> uh, go. I wanted to just mention that one of my favorite things that you do is your um, thrift store uh, sculpture that, uh, you know, I didn't include. no, that you didn't include. So I just thought I'd bring it up since you didn't include it and let everybody knows that um, Deg makes these amazing little assemblage thingy bob thing sculptures that just astonished me. And the first time I saw them was um, the first time I ever saw your work, which was it curated a few years ago. And I went, whoa, who is this guy? And here you are. You're no, this thank guy. You. Yeah. You yeah. know, I have actually forgotten about those until you just mentioned them. <laughs> oh, they're so good. They are yeah. so good. Yeah, that reminded good. me that I, I went through a year or two phase of, of uh, doing a, a thrift store assemblage. You know, it was, a uh, I would just, and, you know, I'm sad to say I've still got 15 or 20 boxes of, of material that has yet to be assembled. So. <laughs> oh, good. We have something yeah. to look forward to. Yeah, awesome. I, know. I think I went through that phase and I, I, I did a lot of pieces and I'm glad that you got the, I love the Marlboro man. So there you yeah, go. I do too. Thanks Beth. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, what a treat. Thank you so much, Dag. It was just, it was a thank you, Rose and uh, Hedwig. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to the uh, Pearl Valley Arts. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Glad to be a part of your scene down there. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Very welcome. So I just want to remind people to please uh, mute yourselves on your computer so we can't, so that we will leave all the speaking noise to the presenter. Okay, I'm going to do that right now. Thanks, Thank Rosie. You. Okay. And I'm really happy to present our final artist who is um, has a lot of delight and joy and depth to offer us as well. Um, Juan Fuentes is a printmaker and social activist. Currently, he has a huge retrospective show of prints in our new Porter Building Gallery in downtown Watsonville on Main Street. And this exhibit came about in conjunction with the recent showing of Watsonville Film Festival's feature, Strawberry Picker. And that was that, that, that movie is about Juan's art and life. And it also ties in with the monumental mosaic murals that he designed for the ongoing community mosaic project of Watsonville Briante that has been headed by Kathleen Corsetti. Um, I do want to make a public announce, a public apology I've already apologized to Juan that in the announcement, I put that there are three monumental mosaic murals in that beautiful space of the outdoors of that parking lot, but there's actually four. So that's, I'm correcting my mistake and my error. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we're so excited to have you Juan and to have so much of your art in Watsonville right now. And to, we would just look, we're looking so forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm not worried about three. <laughs> you said three, that's fine. <laughs> no problem. I'm just happy that I've been connected to uh, the Pajaro Valley Arts and, and its, its community and its artists. So, I, you know, what can I say? It's, I'm 73 years old and it's just like, there's something going on and it's taken a long time. And it's not like I needed all that, you know, but but it's happening and it's happening at a good time. I feel like there are things that are going on that, uh, you know, a lot of artists don't necessarily get that in their lifetime. So I'm really grateful and honored that it's happened in, you know, the town where I grew up. It was beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. So I, I guess I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue, but um, thank you for for having me and 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 the other two artists. I, I really enjoyed learning about both Dag and and Linda and the way they approach their work. It's so 
uh, different from mine in that, you know, I, I guess I didn't have, I haven't had the luxury to kind of just have fun with it, but I, uh, on some, ex on some respect I have, I mean, I've done the works that I'm showing you are pretty much going to be my political and, you know, uh, uh, carvings and so forth, but, uh, you know, sometimes I just take out those pastels and a black piece of paper and I dress, uh, paint or draw with the pastels and just do shapes, uh, influenced a lot by the, um, you know, the Aboriginal paintings that I've seen. And I just love those things. And uh, they're really loose and free. And so I have some of those, but I just, I don't even show that work. I have other things and I've done a lot of pastel work in my time, but um, I love seeing, uh, you know, both Dak and Linda's work. And it's kind of an inspiration to kind of, you know, have some fun with it as well, because I'm so serious about my stuff sometimes. And I, I can't seem to pull away because there's so many issues going on in the world and I keep trying to address them because that's the only way that I could get some sanity, I guess, in my own life, right? So I'm a, you know, I'm a product of the uh, Chicano movement and I came out, my work comes out of uh, the struggles that were going on and, uh, you know, in the early 70s, well, yeah, early 70s, 80s. Um, I'm a graduate of San Francisco State. Uh, I got to San Francisco State in 1969. I was recruited by the, um, the, um, oh God, I'm already losing my, I'm losing my train of thought, but it was the uh, educational opportunity program, basically, and I was recruited with a friend. And really, it was just kind of, uh, you know, the art thing is still kind of a magical thing to me because I uh, had no art training whatsoever when I got to college. And it was really uh, by magic and by coincidence that I um, I walked into the art department one day on my way back. I was going back to the dormitory after one of my classes. It was around noon, afternoon, and then I just, I hit upon the art department on my way through and I just was hearing all these sounds and it was just uh, there was a sculpture a metal sculpture class going on outside and so I I was attracted to the sounds and then I ended up going into the building and I basically went through the whole department and uh, then I realized that it was there was something magical in that place you know going through ceramics and printmaking and painting and uh, you know, I came out of there and I, I just, I have to do something, you know, I have to do something with this. So I, uh, because I was not an art major, I basically um, had to take an introductory art class and I took an art class with a professor by the name of Ralph Putzker. Uh, and uh, he was really influential. I mean, he really helped me see how beautiful art was and how to see the world in an artistic kind of way. And I just, you know, I, I guess I was seeing those things already because I had seen it in Watsonville. I had seen it in, you know, in the, in the ocean. I'd seen it in the fields and all this stuff. I mean, it was there. It was in me, but I, I needed something to push it out. And uh, he was he was the person that kind of helped me, you know, uh, do that. But, and by taking the inter introduction to art, I was able to take other art classes and I just kept taking art classes and uh, until I finally, they had to declare me an art major. I had no idea what I was gonna do. Well, one of the things that happens at San Francisco States, when I got there, it, there was, it was the tail end of the, of the strike and the struggle for ethnic studies. And so, um, you know, I got, an, I, got, I got moved by all that because there were police on the campus while I was there and, um, I was lucky enough to take a, a silk screening class by uh, a Chicano professor by the name of Rupert Garcia, who was also a poster maker. Uh, Rupert Garcia introduced me to another Chicano poster maker who was, uh, thank you, you can, you, can, you can move it. That's fine, you can leave it there. Uh, who was Malakios Montoya, who was, who was teaching at, at uh, 
at Berkeley, at Cal Berkeley in the Chicano Studies Department. He was doing a poster workshop there. So as a result of uh, Rupert and um, Malakias, I, I got an, I decided that I wanted to get involved with posters because posters were needed at that time. My, my degree is in painting and drawing, but I, uh, and, and, and you know, it's, the interesting thing is that when I went, when I went to art school at San Francisco State, it was the school of um, photorealism. So it was people like uh, Robert Bechtel, J James McLean, you know, uh, works that were being done a lot like Chuck Close and those kind of things. So my early drawings, which I don't have any here, but my early drawings are just like pencil drawings of, and pretty realistic pencil drawings. So I really started to, I had to learn how to draw. So I, you know, I started doing these really photo realistic kind of drawings. And um, I mean, I love to draw a lot of my work, you know, especially the, the relief work that I do now is it, it involves a drawing. But so anyway, I started doing uh, posters and um, and this this is an early poster that I did in 78 and it was done for the uh, an organization, women's organization called the Third World Women's Alliance, which later turned into the Alliance Against Women's Oppression. And my partner, Michelle, was actually part of the organization. I, I also did another poster for them uh, for the World Women's Conference in Nairobi, Kenya in 1985. Because I was connected to, you know, I was I had a partner who was part of the organization. I I was one of the lucky males I got to do some of the posters for the women's uh, movement in the early 70s and 80s. So this one I, was one of the posters that I did. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we were doing back then, it was like really kind of really flat and hand cut. And I liked that kind of work. I we were pretty much uh, you know, Rupert Garcia and myself, I think we were influenced by the uh, Cuban poster makers and the real like flatness of the works that were being done. There's an artist by the name of Rene Maderos uh, from Cuba who's doing a lot of super colorful work um, or, or in, in support of the, the Vietnamese re really. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, that I was influenced by that and by that kind of work. And so anyway, this, it's an early poster um, uh, that was done in that style, but this was done offset. It was offset printed. So I learned how to work with images and type and, you know, space and graphic design, basically. You know, I, I learned from seeing, seeing others work and how they were doing and how they were treating an image and text and what was important uh, because we wanted to have these works out in the community and we wanted people to, you know, identify with them. And so how do you, how do you make them, you know, how do you give them the strength, right? You can go to the next one. Uh, Encuentro del Canto Popular, it's part of a music festival. And uh, this is, this was the eighth annual, but there's been about 40 of those. And I think I did at least maybe 30 of the posters for the organization Acción Latina, which was connected to El Tecolote newspaper, which is a community newspaper in the Mission District that I was uh, also, you know, volunteered for for like 10 years. We used to do all the layout and paste up and all that. So a lot of these posters, they're like, uh, and including this one, a lot of them are, you know, there's like hand, hand done, hand cut stencils and all that. This, the dot com plague, you know, it was basically, you know, the you know, the, uh, it was a whole bunch of techies that came into the mission uh, in the early 2000s. They kind of took over everything and they kind of ran a lot of people out of the mission. And I was the director of Mission Grafica at the Mission Cultural Center at the time. And uh, this young man who had just graduated from graphic design school uh, in somewhere in the Midwest, he came in, he was from Spain but he followed his girlfriend out here to San Francisco. And then he came into the Mission Cultural Center one day and he wanted to work with us. And he told me he was a graphic designer. So I had, I had this idea for this poster and I basically uh, 
he put this together for me on in a computer basically and it was basically based off of uh, my idea and what i wanted to do so it was the first time i worked this way i mean the rest of the time i'm doing everything by hand and drawing and hand cutting he did this all on a computer and it was all new to me right uh, and it was part of the the, the san francisco uh, print collective that i was a part of anyway you can move on yeah. um this is um a print I did of Cesar Chavez, you know, uh, I'm I'm one of 11 uh, children in my family. Uh, my parents were born along the a border in on the Texas side uh, in Ridosa, Texas. And uh, then they migrated to New Mexico and then from New Mexico, they ended up in Salinas Watsonville area. And uh, I ended up, uh, you know, we worked as a family we worked in the farm labor camps there in Watsonville and Salinas. And uh, I mean, I think I went to every grammar school that's out there. I mean, I went to Prunedale High School. I went to Moss Landing. I went to, I graduated from Hall School. I mean, I went to all of them, Pajaro. Um, so the, the farm workers um, and the farm workers struggle, it, it had a big impact on my wanting to do uh, political posters. And the other thing with the posters was that I could, uh, since we didn't have access to a lot of the museums and galleries at that time in the early 70s and 80s, uh, we had to kind of create our own galleries and our own spaces. And in doing so, we, we, we would post our posters up in the community and that became our gallery, that became our space. And that's where people saw our work. And uh, so this is a, a tribute to, um, or that was a tribute to, you know, Cesar Chavez, and I'm kind of telling the story instead of a whole bunch of different um, uh, imagery, imagery on there, but you can go to the next one. Let me keep going. Um, I, I was basically, you know, sometimes I respond to things that are going on. So I was, I did this, uh, and it was connected to the the war in Afghanistan and also the, the Iraq War. Um, and you know, it's just a combination of a whole bunch of images that I took and I kind of redrew everything, and I. You know, I happened to be at my dentist and I there, there was a recruiting uh, a station right right next to the dentist. And since I had to wait with, for the dentist for a little while, I walked into the recruiting station. It was a Marines or something. And uh, there was nobody in there, but they had all this literature. So I grabbed a ton of it and I took it out. And I was just, I took it because I just wanted to throw it away. But I... But once I got home, I looked at it and then I saw these great helicopters and I said, well, one day I'll use these for, for something. So anyway, that's where those came from. Um, so anyway, just a lot of the stuff that's going on in the Middle East and I responded to it, you know, you can, you can go move, move on to the next one. Um, this is uh, called Hermanita. It's a relief print um, done like in a, a block basically that I kind of, cut up and I was able to, you know, add color to it. Uh, she's one of the one of the murals that was done uh, with uh, What's No Brillante. So I'm really happy, really happy with it. It was it came from a sketch that I did coming back from New Mexico on a on a trip. And then I did a little sketch and then I basically um, kept developing the sketch and then I I carved her out and it was one of my more successful line carvings and because I use a lot of lines in my in my relief and then I basically uh you know I was able to to use the line there in a way that kind of made more sense to me you know you can go to the next one so um this is uh called Luis de las Flores but it is a it was a relief print that was done in black and white and then I decided it was just so much work to try to do a multi-block with it. And since I was a screen printer, I had been a screen printer for, for many years, I went ahead and I re-editioned it and I did it in silk screen. So then I, I thought, well, this is great because I can now I can, you know, I can addition some of these things and screen print them and add color to them. I mean, I, I work a lot with black and white, but I also uh I've done a lot of stuff in color. It was for a while I, I couldn't get away from black and white. And then I started using pastels and then I 
I couldn't stop using color. So then I then I went back. When I started doing my relief prints, I I went back back to black and white again. Los Inocentes is basically a, it was a a traveling exhibition. Uh, a friend of mine uh, organized in Mexico and it traveled around the, it started at the University of Guadalajara, then it traveled around, but it was really, it was people, it was our reaction or our response to uh, kind of the violence and the things that were going on along the border. And this is a, this is a woodcut. It's done out of a piece of sheena wood. It's a little softer to cut and uh, that's that's what I came up with. So. It traveled with the show. You can move on. Uh, this is um, another woodcut. It's the another one of the pieces that was done at the as a mosaic, basically, and it's really beautiful. And we added some we added some color to it. Uh, I didn't I didn't, I didn't have a clue when uh, Kathleen Crusetti asked me to be a part of the project. I I just wasn't I couldn't you know visualize how they were gonna create these uh, lines and dimensions that, that it needed on a mosaic, but um, it's blowing me away. I didn't know that they could do that. And it's just, it's just taking it to a whole nother, another visual language that people can, that others can see now and it's public. And so it's, this is, this was, um, I'm really, I'm really happy with it, excited about it. I mean, this one, this piece tells a whole story, but I'm not going to go into the whole story because it's a there's a lot. But I'm going to keep going. Let's, let's go on to the next one. Um, like I say, my my parents, you know, we worked in the fields, and there in Salinas, we picked strawberries and all that. And I I, I didn't pick much strawberries uh, as a kid. I mostly ate strawberries. So when they, the the film that they made of me, strawberry picker, I think I, I told somebody I was a, a strawberry eater, but. Uh, one of the things that uh, that happened while I was working out in the fields is that the Bracero program was there and the Braceros were working out in the field. And I had, you know, I was able to, you know, interact with them because they worked in the same field that I worked in or that my parents and my brothers and sisters worked in. And uh, one of the things that would happen is that it, they would line up to have uh, to have lunch and they would just run out of the field that at noon when the noon whistle blew and they would line up and they would serve them this food. So I would always line up with them. And so that little boy there sitting there, is, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of me there sitting there waiting to, you know, have some food with them. You can go to the next one. And that was a, that was a, um, a you know, a lino cut. Uh, this is a wood cut. Uh, it's uh, called a lonely dancer. It's basically playing, paying tribute to the, the, the Ohlone's and he was, uh, this is from a photograph that I took when I was at the Stanford powwow a few years ago. And uh, uh, this this young man here was interacting with one of my grandkids. And uh, so I, I took some images of pictures of him. And then I ended up, this is what I ended up uh, doing based on his, um, you know, based on what he was wearing. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it's hand print. This is hand printed onto Japanese paper, and then I watercolored uh, the the face. That's the color that you see. And I've been I've been kind of doing that to some of my relief prints. I go back in and I add some uh, watercolor to it. And then let's see, twenty nineteen. I I did a artist residency uh, at the Blue Mountain Center in New York. And I was there for a month, and I, this was one of the pieces that I worked on while I was there. And it's basically uh, my cousins on my father's side who are uh, in Chihuahua, and I had gone down there uh, with my cousin who lives in New Mexico in our in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We went down to visit, and it was during the it was during the Trump administration. So I thought, oh my God, it's going to be crazy to cross the border, but we were able to cross. The border. It was it was harder to go into Mexico than to get out of Mexico, which was interesting to me because I thought for sure it was going to be all this. You know, the border was sealed off and nobody could go in and out, and it was just such a big lie. When I went down there, it was like there were hundreds and hundreds of Mexicans 
going back during Christmas vacation with their trucks and cars filled with stuff. They go, they go there and then they're going to come back and go back to work. So it was just totally the opposite of what we've been hearing in the news. Um, and then when we came back, I, that's when I got more, uh, I, I, we had more trouble, you know, getting out of Mexico than we did. <laughs> I mean, getting into Mexico than getting out of Mexico. Uh, this is a, this is called in el cielo in the sky. It's another uh, relief print. And it, again, it, this one was also used um, at um, uh, on the mural project. And, and this was, this piece was a collaboration with a friend of mine named Domingo, Francisco Dominguez, who's a photographer. And he gave me some images that I used um, to, and this is one of the images that I used that he, he loaned me to use. And I basically did this. This was during my residency in, at, uh, at, in, in New York as well. You can go on to the next one. And this is, uh, Another, this is another lino piece that I did, and it's a little girl, and she's reading a book, and she's, you know, I it was I started out the drawing, I started drawing her, and then I, I had a big block, so I just kept adding things to it, and I basically, uh, you know, it's just kind of telling a little story, and I kind of like working like that sometimes. I just start with a basic idea, and then I just kind of add and add, and I keep adding and. Uh, and then things change and, um, you know, you don't know where you're going to go until you just do it. So and I like, I love carving. Well, I like doing stuff. This is uh, about the women uh, that have been killed in Mexico. And this is another piece that I did during my residency in, in, in New York. Um, so it's just about women basically and all their you know, they're all, you know, your sister, your aunt, your niece, your wife, and so forth. And a couple of these images were, uh, were loaned, uh, were loaned to me by uh, Francisco Dominguez, who had photographed the stuff that was going on on the, on the border. And then um, this is another piece that I did during my residency. And it was uh, basically, I you know, I, I wanted to, um, I just, I want these, these images that I saw in the uh, National Geographic were so beautiful of these people and this, you know, and what's going on with the Kayapu people in the other, you know, parts of the rainforest is some, they've destroyed so much of it and it's going to affect everybody. And so, uh, you know, I had to do something with it. And so anyway, I started out just drawing them and then it turned into a poster and, um, uh, you know, that's just the way it, you know, it happened. The, the ferns, this part of the back, the ferns in the back, they were actually, uh, once I kind of drew them out, I said, I need something in the background. So I, I just went out, there was a, we're, we're out in the woods out there where I was at. So there were a lot of ferns out there. So I just took the ferns and I rolled ink up on them and I stuck them on the block and then I printed them onto the block and then I carved them out. So that's what I ended up with. And then I, there's another little, and this is also a woman from the Amazon. And um, I just uh, silk screened it. I, I cut her in black and white first, and then I go back and then I uh, add some color to them, basically. And it's just a tribute to the women there. Um, during COVID, I was uh, asked by the Arts Commission to, along with some other artists, to do, to pay tribute to the workers. Uh, that you know the taking care of everybody, the healthcare workers, and so uh, I wanted to do something for the Latino community, and uh, so this is a woman that I selected, and uh, it turned out that I mean I just randomly found this photograph of I was looking for doctors and all that, and I found this woman, and it turns out she was one of the head you know doctors at uh, and Latina at. At the as, as SF General, and she had also done a lot of work with the uh, AIDS patients and all that. So, and she was just thrilled that she ended up get, I, you know, ended up giving her one of these. So I basically just carved it out, and then I added, you know, watercolor to it. 
And then I'm, um, I'm getting ready. I'm part of a Chicano exhibition that's going to be at the Tennessee Valley Museum in um, Alabama. It's going to be in August and, and September. And so I'm doing some works around that. And this was uh, one of the pieces that I'm doing. Low riders. I'm doing like subcultures, and 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 the part of the subcultures are low riders and bikers. And I'm also doing uh, a danzante, which is one of the dancers, uh, Aztec dancers. And these are linoleum cuts. That's it. Wonderful, Juan. It's so wonderful to hear your story and to see these works. And I know that you. You're extremely um, prolific in your life with all of your art. And I think if people could make it to the to see your show in Watsonville at the Porter Building, that would be really even more wonderful to see them. In yeah, the yeah, place. please, please check it out if you get a chance to go see it, because there's a lot of other work. And that's, you know, it's like I say, it's mostly um, the posters and printmaking that are in that show. But, you know. I have so much other stuff I could have filled up the whole damn building. Wow. And but that's there's open. enough there. And I'm really happy with the, the fact that they're mostly prints and you know that they have not been shown like that in that capacity. So I'm really happy with that. Wow. And people can see it without an appointment on Fridays from four to six for the next right. few weeks, I think. I'm gonna be there on the 25th. Oh. Because I have to do a I have to do a talk uh, at, at Cabrillo for for the senderos for the the the, the youth they're going to have a, something there and so I'm going to be there it's uh, like a role model thing. anyway yes. so but I, then I'm going to try to go over to the gallery because I want to see it so any yeah. questions or. <laughs> Juan, I want to thank you. I got the honor to help hang your work, and I felt so honored. Oh, thank you. And I'm also honored to have you in the Takeaway Show. I'm just a big fan of yours. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you know, you just do what you got to do. And I, I, I'm lucky that I kind of found, uh, you know, I found that I, I like to carve, and I didn't realize that. Um, it was kind of again by accident because I was I had been working and teaching at the county jails at San Bruno and um, I said I got to do something that will get me kicked out of here because I was tired of I didn't want to go to go mm -hmm. to work in the jails anymore I only took it because I just I couldn't get a teaching job anywhere and I was like I got to teach somewhere so it was a job so I took it but um, I said you know I want to do a carving class there and so the 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 sheriff that was there, the head, the head person that was there told me I was crazy, but uh, they said if I if I could figure out a way to get tools in and out of there, um, they would do it. So I said, well, that's really easy. So, you know, the little speedball things, they come, the little speedball cutters, they come and they all have a little packet of little cutters that you can change. Well, I just got a block of wood, I carved, I drilled some holes and then I put all these little little cutters on top of there I stuck them on there and I when I went to the sheriffs I say look this is the block it has all the cuts on it when I come out there's going to have all the tools back on there again and uh as long as I accounted for all the handles and all the tools they didn't care because they put me in a room with inmates they figured if they cut him up and they cut each other up who cares right so <laughs> but I ended up I ended up carving a little block to show them what they could do and I carved a little um again I carved this woman and child this woman carrying this child and I carved it out and uh and that was it uh, that was that was the end of it I I couldn't stop drawing and carving after that I couldn't even keep up with printing and I still cannot keep up with the printing because I'm not I'm not really interested in what the what the finished thing is anymore I'm just more interested in the process and the carving so mm. uh, so I'm having now I'm having to find because I'm 73 years old I'm having to try to figure out a way that I can get someone to help me print because I basically I'm um, printing two or three things and then I just don't want to print anymore mm. you know? but I am getting a couple of copies out that I need for shows and then that's it so, so. 
Anything well, else? you have you have a you have a deep history with your culture and with you know in, in moving in Wattsville and also moving through that with your large family and to this beautiful <laughs> art career that you have with and you can tell so many stories and have so many images about all of that you that you witness and that you feel about and that you come from and it's just it's really wonderful for the for the whole world to witness. Yeah, it's, well, it's story. pretty amazing. I mean, it's pretty amazing that. You know, I was able to really, you know, just follow what I wanted to do and just keep doing it. And um, I mean, I've totally surpassed anything that I thought I was ever going to be able to achieve. I mean, that you know, the fact that um, you know they just had um, the Smithsonian just had the uh, exhibition which I think it's still traveling it's called printing the revolution which is basically uh Chicano arts from 1965 to the present which you know now I'm I'm a part of that I'm part of the the Chicano poster movement and the historical part of that mm -hmm. so that's really pretty incredible for me to say that you know they, and they have a collection of my work at the Smithsonian as well as the at the Library of Congress as well as a collection of my work and uh and then i have a, a personal archive that was set up for me at the uh, university of santa barbara in the C in, at sema the chicano, stu chicano studies there so i'm like there's everything else is just you know <clears throat> I, I, what can i say i mean I, I don't have to do anything it's like it's already been done right i i got um the california society of printmakers uh gave me an honorary you know, um, an honorary uh, membership for life, for life. And it's only been like, uh, in a hundred years, it's only been like a dozen people that have gotten that. So I'm like, how in the hell did I get that? You know what I mean? But <laughs> it's happened and, yeah. you know, it, 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 hasn't, it hasn't made me rich, but, you know, hey, I just do the art and let it be what it is, you know? Uh, who cares if somebody buys it or doesn't buy it or if I get rich or not. It, I, I'm rich anyway because I have a family and kids and grandkids and, you know, and I have Watsonville. So, hey, how much richer can you be than that? I was so, <laughs> I was so inspired by, uh, by uh, Juan's work. I, I just happened to be sent over there by... Uh, by the PBA when I was dropping off those silly cardboard ants, so they sent me over to the to see your show, and uh, and I saw the the one um, room with all the kind of the old school um, oh the uh, poster silk screen work. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that completely resonated with me because I remember back when I was in the you know in the in 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 my political phase you know my social social political phase that i was i was completely intrigued by really old school um um silk screen of really simple silk screen art you know not necessarily with the chicano thing but with the uh with the uh you know rush with the, all the stuff the russian american all the stuff that was being done with in, in war all wartime silk screen yeah it's just and uh and a very small amount of time that i spent in school um there was a there was a there was a silk screen cadre there that were really interested in that and i was so gratified to see your um uh, your uh not only all your work but in particular nice. the silk screen Stuff. it really yeah i know you really mentioned resonated. you mentioned the uh, um the pit river poster that i did for the yeah pit river yeah that crime. i just i oh. just stood in front of that pit river poster for quite a while yeah right. and we'll talk about that again but yeah well you know i was you, Juan, i was um i was also a member of the uh native american defense committee that did work around uh native american political prisoners which mm -hmm. oh uh, yeah. which was kind of an offshoot of the American Indian movement, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I've yeah. done a lot of stuff. And uh, some of the stuff I've done, it was like, you know, they, they come knocking on your door when you do some, you do a little too much. <laughs> oh, we haven't do that. And uh, 
and I You're just safe with art though. With art, you can do a lot of stuff. You can, you can yeah, you can. You and the, and they and they will come knocking at your door. Oh yeah, they they did. <laughs> yeah, they did. I, I also wanted to say uh, really quickly that um, I've been a huge admirer of uh, Ka uh, Kathleen Crochetti's um, uh, mosaics, and oh, yeah. uh, I, was, I was just blown away. I mean, when I went to your show in Wattsville and I saw the originals, I was like, wow, okay. Now I know where those came from. Yeah. And it's just beautiful art. And I think Ka I think Kathleen is is Kathleen is an angel. I mean, she's she did a great job. Watsonville is her, uh, lucky to have somebody like her because she's really I'm just amazed that she art. was able to trans transcribe your uh, graphics yeah. to that massive yeah. thing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. beautiful work. And that's gonna that's gonna be there for a long time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Juan. All Thanks right. a Thank lot, you. Juan, and Dak, Thank and you. Linda. This has been such a wonderful event for all of you to be part of this. And I, I want to say that um, the three of you are so different, but the, each of you have so much kindness and uh, approachableness and uh, and depth. And it's just it's just it's a wonderful way to get to know more more about your work, but also about you individually. So it's just you've been a real it's been a real treat and treasure for all of us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You guys. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. There are, there are, I think there are a few uh, chats I'm going to read. Let me see. Um, Susanna, Suzanne Simmons was asking about uh, how to get to the, um, to the show and to be able to uh, buy art. So I just wanted to remind anybody who doesn't know about that, that it's going to, the, the exhibit of takeaways will be at Sutton Street uh, from the 22nd for about the next six weeks. And the hours are Wednesday through, th through Sunday, uh, 11 to four. And you can go there and pick something off the wall and pay for it and take it home. So that's that's a wonderful fun. And also it's, it supports the gallery in a big way. That's a, one of our, it's our main fundraiser. Um, let's see what else can I tell you? I think that's about it, but uh, yes. Can I say something to Juan, who I don't know? Yes, excuse I me. Just, I just want to say that um, he totally blew my mind. And, you know, beyond the amazing content and your obvious technical skills, the beauty of the work. Uh, your artistic soul and your artistic eye just uh, a couple of those pieces you know when Hedwig put them up I just I, they just astonished me just in their beauty so I want to oh, okay. thank you thank you I you know I, I I've tried to like really uh, address people of color in in a really dignified and beautiful way because I so a lot of times in the media, we're, we're not portrayed that way. So it's really important for me to, to show that we're, you know, we have love and we have humanity just like everybody else. So you got to show it. I just want to thank all of you. I feel just so lucky to be in such an amazing art community with these fabulous artists. It's inspired me so much. So thank you. It's amazing how all of you blended despite how different you are with your mediums. And it was real joy to watch. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. And you Thank should you. see the exhibit before at 37th Sudden Street before all the art goes because it's best now to see it early. It's beautiful. Thank you for being part of it. Yes, thank you. thank you all. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for your presentations, you three. Thank you, Rosie. Hey, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie, for doing such Thanks, a fabulous Rosie. job running the thing. That was oh, great. Thanks.